this parliament must show that this behaviour. Senator Anton, you will be in continuation when debate resumes. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Assistant Treasurer Sukkar has said about the home builder, and I quote, our view has been that this is a jobs program. It's going to support half a million jobs in the residential construction industry. Does the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, stand by these numbers? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, home Builder, of course, is a very uh, important uh, program which recognises that the residential construction sector uh, is of critical uh, importance to the Australian economy, and which is, of course, why a number of state governments, including the state Labor government in my home state of Western Australia, has uh, taken uh, certain measures to support that sector. Pre-COVID, the residential construction sector forecast commencements of 171,000 compared to a forecast of 111,000 post-COVID commencements. Uh, Home Builder is expected to boost residential construction activity, directly supporting 140,000 uh, tradies and a further uh, up to 1 million jobs indirectly in the residential uh, construction sector. Uh, these are, of course, estimates, uh, and as always with estimates, as, as indirectly in the residential Order. construction sector. And I further one million jobs indirectly through the, in the residential construction sector. These are estimates. We will, of course, monitor the uh, implementation of this very important scheme. The uh, home builder is primarily about new construction of dwellings, with Treasury expecting around 20,000 new dwellings to be supported uh, by the policy, compared to around 7,000 substantial renovations. So far, over 22,500 people have registered their interest. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, analysis by Credit Suisse has described the Home Builder program as, and I quote, disappointingly small. The research note goes on to say, and I quote, we doubt that the incentives delivered are large enough, nor the eligibility criteria wide enough to really move the, the needle. Why couldn't the government design a program that was capable? capable of moving the needle in the construction sector. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, you know, clearly, we've made judgments uh, based on what we believe is appropriate in the circumstances. Uh, you know, everybody uh, will have their own views. Some people would like us to spend more, others would let us like us to spend less. Uh, we made a judgment about what we believe is appropriate in the circumstances, but of course everybody is entitled to their own views. Senator Gallagher, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The director of the Grattan Institute has described the Prime Minister's announcement as, and I quote, classic retail politics but lousy economics. Australia has entered its first recession in 29 years. Is now the right time for the Prime Minister to be indulging in his passion for spin over substance? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, we completely disagree with uh, the assertion made by the Grattan Institute, but we are used to the fact that whatever we do, uh, there will be commentary from all sides, uh, uh, including the sorts of commentary that uh, Senator Gallagher has just uh, read out. We will continue to make judgments based on what we believe is in the best interest of uh, working families around Australia, and including what is in the best interest of uh, those Australians working in the residential construction sector. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Can the minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government is driving the nation's economic recovery from COVID-19? The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank um, Senator Bragg for that very important question. Uh, of all OECD economies, uh, Mr President, Australia is expected to have the third uh, lowest fall in GDP in 2020. Uh, nevertheless, we do have a very significant challenge in front of us as a nation. We will still have a very significant mountain to climb. Compared to our MAIFO forecasts, it is expected that over $100 billion of economic activity has been lost this year as a direct result of um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We expect that it will take us two years uh, to get back to the level of economic activity we were at pre-COVID-19. But um, our government 
has a plan to lift growth, not just in the next few months, but over the next five years. Our focus will be on jobs, jobs and jobs, providing the confidence and the incentive for businesses to invest and to hire. Uh, we have done it before and we will do it again. More than 1.5 million jobs were created across Australia under our government before COVID-19 hit. Uh, increased investment in infrastructure will continue to be a central part of our plan. And today, the Prime Minister announced our commitment to invest a further $1.5 billion to start work on smaller priority projects identified by the states and territories. $1 billion will be allocated to priority projects which are now sh shovel-ready, with $500 million reserved specifically to target road safety works. Uh, that further $1.5 billion uh, builds on around $7.8 billion worth of projects we've brought forward since November last year. In total, our government has committed nearly $180 billion in economic infrastructure over the next decade, with more than half allocated across the forward estimates. Uh, we have also announced a priority list of uh, 15 major projects worth more than $72 billion in public and private investment. Order. Pro Senator Cormann. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Minister, can you inform the Senate why this is the responsible path? to economic recovery. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, restoring growth and getting Australians back into work uh, is critical when it comes to our budget repair effort moving forward. Our budget has taken a hit, uh, not just because of the necessary expenditure to support the economy, business and jobs through this crisis period, but also because of the impact on, uh, of um, falling revenues. Our expenditure measures were targeted and time limited, but the impacts on revenue will be longer longer lived as the economy makes its way back. That is why we will have to recalibrate our fiscal strategy. We will do that in a responsible way. The budget will be balanced, again, by keeping expenditures under control while boosting revenues through pro-growth policies that lift investment and get Australians back into work. We will not pursue excessive authority nor high taxes. We will pursue growth and responsible budget management that ensures the government lives within its means while still guaranteeing the essential services Australians rely on. We must be very cautious about our expenditure Order. as we navigate Senator our Cullen, way back. Time for the answers expired. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Can the minister inform the Senate about the risks of pursuing a different economic and fiscal policy direction? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Any suggestion? to keep the significantly elevated levels of spending going on forever and ever would harm our economy and harm our budget. It would harm our capacity to sustainably fund the essential services of government on a sustainable basis. That is because it would require higher taxes over time, which would harm growth. Higher taxes over time, which would harm growth. I know that the socialists on the other side find that very hard to understand. Harming growth would harm government revenue over time. That has always, and that of course has always been the Labor way. Higher spending funded by higher growth destroying taxes. Our, our government will put our country on a sustainable and responsible path and give the nation the best possible opportunity to thrive on the other side of this crisis. And of course the Australian people know that this is a government that delivers pro-growth, lower taxes, pro-business, uh, pro-opportunity policies, whereas those on the other side, given half a chance, would go back to impose higher taxes, which leads to fewer jobs. Order, Senator Coleman. Senator Green. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The design of the government's home builder program has been criticised internally and publicly. Housing ex experts are concerned that the home builder program won't deliver for regional areas where the required spend will overcapitalise existing houses. The LNP member for Herbert and the LNP member for Leichhardt have raised concerns that renovations for houses in their electorates will not meet the $150,000 threshold. Minister, how many Australians in regional areas does the government estimate will access the Home Builder Program? Minister representing the Prime uh, th Minister, thank, Senator thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Green for that question. Uh, regional areas will benefit from the new construction component more, comparatively more than other areas, as house and land prices are lower there, allowing them potentially a larger build while remaining under the cap. Uh, it, is, it is true that we've also included. It is true that we've also included the uh, renovation, uh, the substantial renovation component as part of this program, and that is in recognition 
That is in recognition of the fact that many Australian families can't afford to buy a bigger home, so a substantial renovation is the best way of supporting a growing family. Uh, that, is, that is why we've designed the program we have, and we stand by the program, but feel free to keep um, throwing Order. rocks against Senator, it. Senator, have you concluded your answer? Senator Cormann has concluded his answer. Senator Wong. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Senator Canavan has said about the Home Builder program, and I quote, I'm worried we are putting ourselves in a weaker position if asset prices in Australia were to fall. Does Mr Morrison agree with Senator Canavan? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, our, our focus and our commitment is to put Australia in a stronger position. Senator Green. You're not doing it, though. That's the Order. problem. I'm, I'm going to... I'll call Senator Green when there is silence. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The member for New England has said about the Home Builder Program, and I quote, I'm concerned about the complexity of trying to pay back that debt. Does Mr. Morrison agree with Mr. Joyce? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, well, you know what, what uh, Senator Green has clearly noticed is that uh, in the coalition uh, we've got uh, lots of uh, individual members and senators contributing to the policy debate, which is a fantastic thing. Which is a fantastic thing. But let me, but let me also, but let me also, let me also say uh, to um, the member for New England and everybody in this chamber that right around Australia. People are taking out loans to buy uh, land and house packages every single day. Uh, people are going out, going out to uh, take out loans in order to uh, organise uh, substantial renovations. You know, obviously on an ongoing basis. We do. This is a, a program that is designed. It's an important program that is designed to support jobs in the residential construction sector. We will continue to monitor uh, its implementation as we are rolling it out, uh, and uh, you know, we, we are confident that this is uh, going to make a, a positive and necessary contribution. Senator Antich. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Minister, as the global economy faces the greatest economic decline since the Great Depression as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, how will the Morrison government's job maker plan accelerate infrastructure investment to drive our economic recovery and create jobs for Australians? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Antic for the question. Uh, Mr President, the Prime Minister today outlined the next phase of the government's job maker plan to support Australia and Australians' recovery from COVID-19. He announced that almost $72 billion of major infrastructure projects across Australia will now be fast-tracked under an agreement struck between the state federal and territory governments. It will see approval times slashed by half and it will see the creation of 66,000 jobs. Mr President, as a government, we are also committing to a further $1.5 billion to immediately commence work on small priority projects identified by the states and the territories. $1 billion will be allocated to priority projects which are shovel ready, and a half a billion dollars will be reserved specifically to target road safety works. Mr. President, this builds on the $7.8 billion worth of projects we've brought forward since November of last year. Fifteen major projects are on fast track for approval under a bilateral model between the Commonwealth, the states, and the territories. And the projects include emergency town water projects in New South Wales, road, rail and iron projects in Western Australia, the inland rail from Melbourne to Brisbane, the Marinus link between Tasmania and Victoria and, of course, Senator Antic in your home state, the Olympic Dam extension in South Australia. Mr President, these 15 job-creating investments will be brought forward, will be brought forward by targeting a 50 per cent reduction in Commonwealth assessment and approval times for major projects from an average of 3.5 years to 21 months. Senator Antich, supplementary question. Minister, how will the government's skills reform agenda support these job-creating infrastructure projects? Senator Cash. 
Well, Mr. President, the JobMaker program builds on the significant steps that the Morrison government is already taking to transform our training system to ensure that we have the skilled workforce that Australia needs. Our $585 investment in our skills package it is investing supporting Australians to ensure that they have the skills that Australian businesses are telling us that they need. We are establishing the National Skills Commission to improve our skills and our labour market forecasting. We have, of course, established the National Careers Institute to evaluate the status of vocational education and training and to provide evidence-based careers advice on vocational education pathways. We are also supporting, importantly, foundational skills for people with low educational attainment. Mr President, these reforms are critical to supporting Australians into careers, Australian businesses to get the skilled employees that they need and to support our infrastructure investment as Order. we recover Senator from COVID-19. Senator Antich, a final supplementary question. Minister, how will the government's JobMaker plan bring Australians together and support the economy to rebuild following the COVID-19 downturn? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the JobMaker plan is, of course, our roadmap for a new generation of economic success to guarantee the essential services that all Australians rely on. Mr. President, as we all reset for growth, the Morrison government's JobMaker plan will be guided by principles to secure Australia's future. And these principles include: we will remain an outward-looking, open, and sovereign trading economy. We must seek to leverage and build on our strengths an educated and highly skilled workforce that supports a thriving and innovative services sector, and a modern and competitive advanced manufacturing sector. And of course, we must ensure that there is opportunity in Australia for those who have a go to get a go. Mr President, as we have shown, working together across states, across territories, together as Australians, we will be able to restore jobs and support the economic recovery that Australia needs as a result of COVID-19. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Foreign Minister, Senator Payne. Australian citizen Calm Gillespie has been sentenced to death in Guangzhou, China, and has just 10 days left to appeal his verdict. He's been detained in China for six and a half years, and according to media reports, many of his friends thought he'd disappeared. Unlike other cases where Australians have faced the death penalty overseas, there's been no opportunity to mount a public campaign to support Mr Gillespie. Minister, when did the Australian government first become aware of Mr Gillespie's detention, and when did you become aware that he faced a possible death sentence? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Let me begin by saying that uh, I am both saddened and deeply concerned that an Australian citizen Mr Calm Gillespie has been sentenced to death in China and our thoughts are most certainly with him, his family and uh, loved ones. Uh, there are a number of steps uh, to go in the legal process, uh, including an appeal opportunity. We are continuing to provide consular assistance to Mr Gillespie uh, and his family in line with the Consular Services Charter. Uh, Mr President, uh, the Australian Government, through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, has been providing appropriate consular assistance uh, to Mr Gillespie uh, for uh, the period of his uh, detention. Uh, I would indicate to the Chamber that uh, the Government has offered a briefing on this matter to the Australian Greens and I uh, would appreciate the opportunity uh, to take that up with Senator Waters. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks very much, Minister. I look forward to taking you up on that. Um, I'm sure many Australians were as surprised as we were to hear over the weekend that Mr Gillespie had been sentenced to death, given that the public appeared to be unaware of his case. Why is the Australian public only finding out about his plight now? Why have you allowed this to happen? And at what levels and at which times did the Australian government raise this with the Chinese authorities? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. As I would have hoped, the Leader of the Australian Greens in the Senate was aware every consular case with which the government deals is different, uh, and every consular case uh, is handled uh, in consultation with posts, with family, with legal representatives uh, in the most appropriate way. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. Minister, how many other Australian citizens or permanent residents are currently detained in China's opaque and unjust judicial system? And how many are at risk of being sentenced to death during this particularly fractious time in our relationship with China? 
Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I indicated in my response to the leader of the Australian Greens' first question, we are very happy to provide the Australian Greens uh, with a briefing on these matters. That offer has already been made today. Uh, there are a number of Australians uh, in prison in China. Uh, in fact, there are a large number of Australians in prison in a number of locations uh, around the world. That is uh, obviously the case from time to time. Uh, and of course, what we do remind Australians uh, is Australians are always subject to the laws of countries that they are in. There are severe penalties in many countries for behaviour, particularly including drugs, and that includes China. But I will be endeavouring to repeat my offer uh, to uh, the Australian Greens uh, to provide a briefing, an offer which was made earlier today. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. I refer to the Minister who, when announcing the retention bonus for aged care workers, said, and I quote, this will mean a payment of up to $800 after tax per quarter, paid for two quarters for direct care workers. Does the minister stand by this statement? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Walsh, for the question. Uh, Senator Walsh is correct. We have made uh, a specific decision as government to provide support to residential aged care workers. Uh, and, and some of those who are working in uh, home care services to support them uh, and to indicate to them that, uh, as a government, we are, they are important to us and to the community, and we want them to continue to come to work because, in the early stages of the COVID-19 outbreak, Mr. President, we found that there were some, particularly residential aged care workers, who had said that they um, did not want to come to work, particularly in the circumstance where there was a COVID outbreak within the residential aged care facility uh, that, we, that they were working in. One thing that we didn't say, Mr. President, is that the, uh, that the bonuses would, not be, would be tax free, because they're not. And that's not how these sorts of uh, income bonuses work. And Mr. So, Mr. President, uh, we, we said up to $800, or we said up to $800 and up to $600 uh, on each quarter, and so, Mr. President, uh, $1,600 additional income to uh, workers in residential aged care is a significant amount of money, and we uh, always said in our statements up to, Mr. President, and Mr. President, uh, $600, so $1,200 into um, into home care services. Uh, Mr. President, we never said at any point in time that these, that these support bonuses would be tax-free. That was never said, Mr President. So we are quite proud of the fact that we continue to support residential aged care workers and home care workers as a part of uh, our response to the COVID-19 process. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Uh, Order. Yes, I refer to the minister who, when announcing the retention bonus for aged care workers, said it would provide, and I quote again, two payments of up to $600 after tax per quarter for two quarters for those who provide care in the home. Does the minister stand by this statement in relation to the payments being after tax? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, it's, it's good that the uh, Senator, in her supplementary question, actually acknowledges what I just said in my response to the first question, where we said up to $600 and up to $800, Mr. President. And, and as I said in my first answer, we never said at any point in time uh, that it would be tax-free, because that is not how income bonuses work. Uh, in exactly the same way, same way that JobKeeper is subject to tax, uh, these bonuses are also subject to tax. And it's good, Mr President, that uh, the Senator has acknowledged in her question what I said in the answer to, my, in, to her first question, which was that these, these would be up to $800 and up to $600. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. Thank you. When the guidelines uh, for the retention bonus were released late on a Friday afternoon, it was revealed payment amounts were switched to being before tax. 
When and by whom was this decision made? Why, when it comes to the, to the delivery of the retention bonus, has the government again failed to deliver on its spin? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the announcement that we made was consistent uh, with approaches that we're making to all income bonuses, uh, Mr. President. And so, uh, as I have said, and as Senator Walsh has indicated in her second question. We always said that these were up to $600 and up to $800 per quarter. And Mr. President, the decision that was in the guidelines that were released was a decision of government. Uh, that was a decision of government. Uh, so, in direct response to the question that uh, Senator Walsh has asked, we said all along that these bonuses would be up to $600 per quarter and up to $800 per quarter. And Mr. President, this is and I'm quite proud of the fact that this government has chosen to support residential and home care workers in their efforts during the COVID-19 outbreak, because we understand, Mr. President, we understand the importance of these workers. And at the last election, despite promises and huge tax take, there was no money Order. for Senator workforce Colbert, retention for in the, the Labor Party's promises. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister Cash, representing the Minister for Infrastructure. On 13 November 2019, the majority of coalition senators supported a notice of motion that the Senate, and I quote, call on the federal government to take the necessary steps to ensure the construction of a Bradfield-type scheme can begin in Queensland as swiftly as possible. Speaking to this motion, the government stated, and again I quote, there is no reason for the Australian government to oppose this motion. Today, the Prime Minister announced plans to fast-track a number of infrastructure projects, yet despite the government's claimed support, there was no mention of any form of Bradfield scheme. Why has the government chosen to leave the hybrid or new Bradfield scheme a crucial nation-building project they have expressed their support for off the Prime Minister's list of essential projects to be fast-tracked? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Hanson for her question, and in particular for acknowledging uh, the significant announcement that the Prime Minister made today, as I alluded to in my previous uh, question from Senator Antic, and the uh, bringing forward of infrastructure projects across Australia to create around 66,000 jobs. Uh, in relation to the Bradfield scheme, I can provide you with the following information. Uh, the National Water Grid Authority, uh, which, as you have referred to, commenced operation on 1 October 2019, uh, is working with leading science agencies, including the CSIRO, to determine where and how water resources can be sustainably developed. This forms part of the Australian government's commitment to invest $100 million into bringing world best science together to identify opportunities for enhancing water supply and reliability for regional Australia. As part of this work, the authority is considering options for developing large-scale water harvesting and transfer schemes, such as elements of the Bradfield scheme or hybrid versions of the Bradfield scheme, to capture and transport water to both grow agricultural sector and improve drought resilience. Over the decades since it was first proposed, there have been a number of assessments on the merit of the original Bradfield scheme and more recent variations. It is important that the feasibility of these schemes are now investigated using the best available contemporary science. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. There has been, um, inf there has been a, uh, a feasibility study done on it by the Snowy Mountain Engineering Corp in 2018. Water security is crucial to all Australians, especially given the horrendous drought that more than 60 per cent of Queensland continues to endure. Why can't the government simply give the people of Australia a firm commitment that the hybrid Bradfield scheme will be added to the Prime Minister's list of projects that will be fast-tracked? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And I would refer Senator Hanson uh, to the answer I just gave to my previous question. And my understanding is the Prime Minister announced certain uh, projects today and said there'd be further announcements to come. 
Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the water schemes that have actually been put in with the dams, but there has been no real commitment to the hybrid Bradfield scheme, which will actually bring water from going out to, to the ocean inland. So, therefore, I say the minister, the government has been very critical of Queensland's Labor's failure to give a clear date on border openings. Is it safe to say that because you won't commit to your date to start this project, that the Liberal National Party have no plans to build the Bradfield scheme? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and Senator Hanson. I will have to reject the premise of your question. And as I said in my answer to your primary question, over the decade since it was first proposed, there have been a number of assessments on the merits of the original Bradfield scheme and more recent variations. It is important that the feasibility of these schemes are now investigated using the best available contemporary science. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is using technology to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and to help support our economic recovery? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Van, for your question. Um, it is um, absolutely unquestioned that, uh, that Australia is doing an extraordinary job uh, to flatten the curve of the, can, uh, the coronavirus pandemic and to contain the spread, which means that we have saved many, many lives of Australians through this process. But now is not the time to be complacent. As restrictions are being eased in our communities, Mr. President, it is absolutely important that all Australians remain safe and they understand what it is that they need to do to remain safe because it's critically important, not just for us as individuals, but it is very important that we don't just protect ourselves, but we actually need to look out for others. And that's why, through a society-wide um, uh, effort to make sure that we, uh, we have the appropriate response in place for the coronavirus, one that, I said, as I said, has made us a world leader and the envy of the rest of the world in areas such as testing, tracing and containing the virus, and we've worked absolutely tirelessly over the last few months to make sure that we have got the capacity in place, and that includes making sure that all Australians have got access to the kind of digital capabilities that they need to navigate their way through this pandemic and as we go forward. And it is absolutely vital that all, Australia, all Australians um, are empowered to proactively limit the spread of the coronavirus and protect the community. And that's why uh, the Prime Minister launched Australia's contact uh, tracing app, COVID Safe, to help protect the lives and the health of the Australian community, to make sure that we were in a position that we could quickly respond and be able to trace people if they had come into contact with somebody who had the virus. Um, and this app complements their existing manual process by which we do currently trace and track people uh, and that, that uh, processes that are being undertaken by state and territory officials. It is absolutely essential that we have this in place as we ease restrictions on social gatherings. Order. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Minister. How else is the government ensuring information is available to all areas of the Australian public? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, the Australian government is, uh, is assisting the Australian public in many ways, but uh, including particularly making sure that we have an easy to access uh, one uh, place of, uh, of information through the australia.gov.au website. It's the central source, it's the authoritative source, it's trusted, it's regularly updated because we want to make sure that all Australians have got the information that they need regarding the coronavirus to keep themselves, their family, their friends and their community safe. Uh, this website brings absolutely crucial information together across all of government agencies so that when people are seeking advice, whether it be about health measures, financial me measures, welfare measures, that they are able to access it in one place. And this is guidance for businesses, for individuals, for travellers, for people with disability. Every Australian can access this site and get the kind of information that they need to navigate our way through this, this pandemic. Over 22 million people have visited the australia.gov.au website so far. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Minister, could you tell us what the government is doing to assist those more vulnerable in the Australian community? Senator Rustin. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, as restrictions begin to ease, it is really, really important that every Australian downloads the COVID Safe app so that we can make sure yeah, yeah. we can resume life as best we can. Uh, we can get people back into jobs. We can get people back out socialising. But to do so, we also need to protect the most vulnerable. And the best way you can protect the vulnerable in, within our community is to make sure that you have the COVID Safe app on your phone. Um, so far, it's been really strongly received through the states and territories, um, and it is being recognised as a very valuable tool, uh, which has enabled our um, states and territories to lift uh, the restrictions and make sure that this virus isn't silently creeping its way through our communities. But in addition to the, uh, the COVID Safe app, we're also encouraging people uh, to make sure that they make themselves available all forms of technology, all forms of information, so that they know what they need to be doing to protect the many vulnerable people that are in our community, because we have an obligation to keep them safe and not just ourselves. Senator McCarthy. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. On Thursday, Senator Stoker appeared on Sky News and said in relation to the Queensland Premier, and I quote, she is choking the economy by having these borders shut. She is the knee on the throat of the businesses of Queensland, stopping them from breathing. Does Mr Morrison agree that it was insensitive and inappropriate for Senator Stoker to use the words of a dying man to make a political point on late night TV? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I didn't see those comments, and rather than to provide a commentary on um, alleged commentary, I'll have a conversation with Senator Stoker separately. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Uh, Mr. President, um, what action will Mr. Morrison take? Senator Cormann. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, it's the first I've heard of this, and I've just indicated what, what uh, I will do before making any further comment. Uh, I'm not aware uh, whether uh, the Prime Minister is aware of this comment, so I would have to take that question on notice. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Senator Stoker is locked in a battle for Queensland LNP Senate pre selection against Senator McGrath. Does Senator Stoker have Mr. Morrison's full support? Senator Cormann. Uh, but th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. <coughs> the Prime Minister supports all his colleagues, and uh, of course, pre selections are a matter for party organisations. Senator Rennick. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. This year has been challenging for all Australians, particularly our seniors. Today, as we mark World, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, can the minister outline the steps the Morrison government has taken to tackle elder abuse in Australia? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Rennick for his question. Uh, Mr President, uh, elder abuse is something that all of us uh, need to pay attention to. It is a particular problem in our community and takes, I think, uh, will require some considerable community attitude change. The government the Morrison government is committed to ending uh, the abuse of Australian seniors in all its forms. Today the government launched an awareness campaign to highlight the issue and assist those ex experiencing physical, emotional and financial abuse to get help. This is one of the many initiatives the government is delivering through the National Plan to respond to the abuse of older Australians. We are also committed Mr. President, to working with the states and territories to consider uh, reforms such as those to enduring powers of attorney laws. Our government also funds various support programs, including a 20 fr uh, 20 free 24 hour phone line, 1800 Elder Help, 1800 353 374, and the Older Persons Advocacy Network, OPAN, to provide free, confidential, and um, independent advocacy on, to support older people, including for matters relating to elder abuse. Uh, Mr President, we have continued with the reform agenda to protect senior Australians in aged care while we continue through the Royal Commission running its course. We introduced unannounced vis uh, re-accreditation visits from 1 July 2018. We established the Independent Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission uh, in, on 1 January last year, bringing together the uh, complaints, accreditation, assessment and monitoring into one agency, as recommended by a number of reviews. We also introduced a suite of critical reforms commencing on 1 July last year. 
new consumer facing standards, a new charter of aged care rights and a new na a national aged care mandatory quality indicator program. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline what measures the government has taken to ensure our senior Australians in aged care are being supported and kept safe during the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and the government has been extremely active to ensure that senior Australians not only are safe but have access to the services that they need during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has continued to do all they can to meet the physical, mental health and social, uh, emotion, uh, social and emotional needs of aged care consumer, consumers. Mr. President. The Commission continues to undertake its uh, critical work, including conducting site visits while ensuring that, for, uh, particularly importantly, infection control requirements on, uh, are, are met with uh, uh, inspectors entering aged care facilities. While it's important to keep older Australians safe from COVID-19, it's also important to ensure that senior Australians in aged care uh, facilities continue to have visitors for their overall wellbeing, Mr President. And in that context, the Code for Visiting residential, uh, residential Aged Care Facilities has been a very, very important initiative undertaken by the government in conjunction Order, with the sector. Senator Colbeck. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline what the government is doing to protect older Australians in residential facilities against abuse. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, I thank Senator Rennick for the question. Um, Mr. President, any mistreatment or assault of senior Australians or an aged care recipient is unacceptable, and the government takes all of those instances extremely seriously. Yesterday, on behalf of the government, I announced a further $23 million investment into the Serious Incident Response Scheme, which was a recommendation of the Australian Law Reform Commission report. Um, to protect vulnerable Australians and senior Australians in aged care from uh, abuse and neglect. Mr President, it's an important measure to increase the transparency to keep our loved ones safe. Residential aged care providers will be required to manage all incidents, including resident on resident and, and importantly resident on resident, and with a focus on safety, wellbeing uh, and prevention. There is still much more work to do, Mr. President, and the safety and well-being of all senior Australians con continues to be one of the key priorities of the Morrison government. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Communications, Cybersecurity, and the Arts. The CEO of Australia Post argued that there was a 50% drop in addressed letter volumes as justification for the government's proposed changes to service requirements. But Australia Post today admitted that the drop in address letter volume for March was seven times smaller than it had claimed and largely in line with forecasts. Why hasn't the government been honest with the Australian people about why it wants to slash postal services? The minister representing the Minister for Cyber Communication, Cyber Safety and the Arts, Senator Reynolds. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the Senator for that question. I find it quite extraordinary that Senator O'Neill could actually ask this question uh, for a number of reasons, because the only mistruths that are coming uh, are from those from the other yeah. side. And in fact, there are seven Order. mistruths, including the one that you have just mentioned. And I thoroughly reject the whole premise of your question. And let me give you seven reasons why the premise of this question is not true. Like, Labor has claimed that Australia Post will cut jobs and remove one in four posties. This is a lie. It is not true. It's, secondly, it's also been claimed that Australia Post wants to cut delivery services in half. This is also not true. Senator Wong on Labor a point of order. Also... Sorry, Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, direct relevance. I know the minister is reading out the very lengthy press release that Senator Cormann put out. What we actually asked her about, what we actually asked her about was material released today by Australia Post, which is their own numbers as to uh, the drop in letter volumes. Senator 
Cormann on the point of order. On the, on the point of order, uh, the uh, minister directly dealt with the uh, question in her opening sentences, in her opening statements, by rejecting the premise of the question. Now, uh, Senator Wong might want to tell the minister how to answer the question, but that is not, that is not in her uh, capacity to do. Uh, so the minister was being directly relevant and she was providing further context for the Senate in an abundance of helpfulness. So on the, on the point of order, I am listening carefully to what the minister says. The Senator Cormann is correct. I cannot instruct a minister how to answer a question. However, once a minister has addressed part of the question, further material that is provided must also be directly relevant. I am listening carefully to the minister. Um, the part of the question I took related to volumes of business being conducted by Australia Post, um, material that refers and relates to the volume. Um, as asserted in the question, is directly relevant. Now, I'm listening to the, minister, the minister's answer. She has one minute 17 remaining. Senator Reynolds. Mr. President, and yes, I am seeking to be complete and thorough in my answer of all of the mistruths uh, that have been told by those opposite in relation to Australia Post. So, parcel volumes are actually up 64 per cent, so you asked for the latest numbers, and letter volumes are down 36 per cent uh, May on year from last year. So let me get back to the fourth untruth from Labor. So fourthly, uh, Labor has claimed Australia and small business will be disadvantaged compared to metropolitan areas. Fourth untruth. The fifth untruth is it's been claimed by Labor that vulnerable Australians will be most impacted by the changes. Guess what? Also untrue. Uh, Labor has also claimed that the changes this government has implemented uh, during COVID-19 are permanent. Again, guess what? Untrue. And the seventh. Uh, the seventh big lie from Labor in relation to Australia Post is that the government wants to privatise Australia Post. Again, guess what? Absolutely untrue. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The CEO of Australia Post has refused to provide a guarantee that there will be no forced redundancies. Will the minister give a guarantee that no Australia Post employees in delivery, transport or processing will be forced into redundancy? If not, how many people will lose their jobs, Minister? Senator Reynolds. Thank you. I think Senator O'Neill didn't listen to my first of my seven uh, untruths because uh, clearly he hadn't heard the first one. So let me just repeat the first big untruth that Labor is peddling. As you've just said, uh, it has been claimed by Labor uh, that Australia Post will cut jobs and remove one in four posties. And this is simply not true. Australia Post has said repeatedly Order. there Senator will Reynolds be no forced Senator Reynolds, redundancies I have Senator or plans Reynolds, to cut posties. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. If it's so easy, will the minister give a guarantee of no forced That's redundancies? That's not a point of order, Senator Wong. That's a restatement of the question. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I mean, S Senator Reynolds directly addressed the question. No forced redundancies. I mean, this is just a complete that and utter furphy. The Labor Party pursuing conspiracy theory after conspiracy. Okay, Senator like, Cormann, completely that's disrupted. not a response to the point of order, but I'll let it go on the basis that there was not even a point of order initially. Senator Reynolds to continue. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And if I can continue on that first point. Uh, so, Australia Post has said there will be no forced redundancies or plans to cut posties' uh, take home pay new to the new temporary arrangements. Many posties will continue delivering letters on bikes, and others will be retrained to deliver parcels in vans because they're up 64 per cent, putting them where, and she will be putting her posties where the work is and that is with parcel posts in particular. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Senator Colbeck told this chamber that the government's proposal to double letter delivery times for many Australians was a response to COVID-19. Can the minister guarantee that Australia Post has not proposed similar changes prior to COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, Senator O'Neill clearly didn't hear my third great myth being peddled by Labor. And I'll repeat that again for the benefit of those in the chamber. It has been claimed by Labor, again repeated now, that wait times for letters will more than double from three to seven days. And that is not true. Mail speed standards order. for regular Senator Reynolds, state letters. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. 
direct relevance, and we can repeat the question if the minister didn't listen the first time. Uh, we are referring to an answer given by Senator Colbeck, where he indicated that this policy response was a response to COVID-19. And we've asked the minister to guarantee that Australia Post has not sought similar arrangements pre-COVID-19. Um, on the point of order, um, the, the, the quote order, the, the quotation asserted from an answer last week did refer, I believe, to lengthening times of delivery. The minister is in order if she is addressing that particular point, um, and that because that is directly relevant because it was part of the quotation. Senator Reynolds. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, I will can say again that it is. You have claimed that there will be increase in wait times for letters from three to seven days. This is not true. Mail speed standards for regular interstate letters, which is mail travelling around our country, have not changed. Order, Senator, they sorry, Senator, order, Senator Reynolds. Senator O'Neill, order, Senator Reynolds, please. Are you seeking a point of order? It's hard to tell. Sorry, at the is that a point of order, yeah. Senator O'Neill? Please go ahead. Senator Reynolds continues. We've heard a lot from her about my hearing capacity. I want to say it's pretty good. Senator Reynolds has not heard the first part of the question, and clearly it was Senator Colbeck who told um, the chamber Senator, that the government's proposal to double, double letter delivery times for many Australians was a response to COVID-19. It was Senator Colbeck Senator who Senator made O'Neill, that fact I, I think, believe it, you are going to the substance of an answer. I cannot instruct a minister how to answer. If the minister is talking about a, a claim that was made in the quotation you've used in your question, she is being directly relevant. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much. I think I've now made this point for the fourth time that there have been no changes, no changes, no changes, no changes, no changes. And I think, as my colleague Minister Fletcher said, Labor is again resorting to its usual by election tactics. Of whipping up a baseless scare campaign Order, for Senator those Reynolds, aged care time for and the answer has Eden expired. Monero. Senator McLaughlin. My question is for the Minister of Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister outline how Australia will expand defence cooperation with India following the elevation of our bilateral relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership, and how this partnership will help drive our economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for the question and also for his enduring commitment to defence and to defence industry. Thank you. Strengthening Australia's defence relationships is a key priority for me and also for the Morrison government. That's why, since becoming minister, I've conducted 16 international visits and also hosted six international counterparts here in Australia. And during COVID-19, I've maintained this tempo of international engagements with over 20 virtual calls uh, with 14 international counterparts. These defence relationships are critically important for our nation, none more so than our relationship with India. The recent Australia-India's Leaders Virtual Summit was a groundbreaking, groundbreaking moment in our relationship. As Minister Birmingham outlined in this place last week, India and Australia is the fifth largest export market with the expansion of our trade relationship, which will be crucial as we both recover from COVID-19. And as my counterpart, Minister Singh, and I discussed at our last call, both our defence forces are playing leading roles in our nation's responses to COVID-19. The Comprehensive Strategic Partnership further strengthens our bonds through two new landmark defence agreements. Firstly, the Mutual Logistics Support Arrangement, which paves the way for deeper and more sophisticated defence cooperation between India and Australia. It will result in increased engagement through more mil complex military uh, exercises, which will enhance our capacity to respond to shared regional challenges. Secondly, the Defence Science and Technology Arrangement, which recognises that collaboration is absolutely essential to optimise research outcomes for both nations. This arrangement will now place our two nations at the forefront of defence technological research. And through both these two new defence arrangements, we will work more seamlessly together to shape Order, an open, Senator inclusive Reynolds, and prosperous the Indo-Pacific. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the growth of Australia's defence cooperation with India and next steps for our engagement? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Mr President. 
It's very pleasing to see that our defence relationship with India continues to grow and to mature. The number of shared activities between the two of us has increased fourfold over the last six years alone. And last year, our bilateral cooperation reached new heights with the conduct of Exercise Oz Index, which is our most complex military exercise together to date. For the first time, our navies undertook anti-submarine warfare exercises together, and our P-8 maritime surveillance and response aircraft flew coordinated missions in the Bay of Bengal. The time is now right for both our nations to increase defence engagement and also cooperation. Our new comprehensive strategic partnership will enable this more complex and comprehensive joint activities, but it will also deepen our cooperation so that we together can address the challenges we both face in our region. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the importance of Australia's defence relationship with India in the Indo-Pacific? Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, India and Australia are not only strong economic partners, but we are also natural security partners, particularly in the Indian Ocean. And as a West Australian, I am particularly cognisant of this. Our shared security challenges in the Indian Ocean include maritime threats terrorism and natural disaster response. All of these have significant implications for the economic prosperity of both our nations. It is in Australia's national interest to work with India to address these challenges, both bilaterally, trilaterally and also multilaterally, through international forums such as the Indian Ocean Rim Association. There has never been a more important time for Australia to work with India and other like-minded nations to shape a prosperous, open and a stable post-COVID Indo-Pacific. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Sophie from Rose Bay in Tasmania is pregnant with her second child. She lost her work contract due to COVID-19 and needed to stay home to homeschool her five-year-old son. As a result, Centrelink have told her that she will no longer qualify for paid parental leave. She could not have planned for this situation. Why does the government believe women like Sophie should not have access to paid parental leave? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. And, uh, I'll take the details of the specific case on notice and refer that to the responsible minister for further information. Mm -hmm. As I've said in the chamber before, Nobody is able to plan for a pandemic. Nobody is able to plan for an economic response that has taken this government to extraordinary ends to address the challenges that the entire Order. country uh, is dealing with. And we have sought very, very hard to work with those opposite, in fact, and to work with uh, the states and the territories in the process of that economic response. As Senator McAllister has raised specific issues in relation to an individual, I'll take those, as I said, on notice. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. Last week, the government voted against women like Sophie retaining their eligibility for paid parental leave. Sophie's child is due in September. She has struggled to find a new job. The government's decision means she only has weeks to find a way to replace the paid parental leave she was going to rely on. Why is the government punishing women like Sophie for the economic consequences of COVID-19? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And there are a number of supports available to families who don't currently meet the paid parental leave tests. Uh, those who have lost a job or have reduced hours during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, should appropriately check with, their, check with their employer if they're in the first instance eligible for a JobKeeper payment. We also recently amended the Paid Parental Leave Act to allow for the period a person receives the JobKeeper payment to count toward the Paid Parental Leave Work Test. Uh, parents who have lost their job but don't meet the Paid Parental Leave Work Test and are not eligible for the JobKeeper payment may be eligible for other payments, such as the Parenting Payment, the Job Seeker Payment, which of course currently includes the $550 fortnightly coronavirus supplement. 
as well as possibly being eligible for family tax benefit, uh, and uh, both parts A and part B, as well as the newborn supplement and the newborn upfront payment uh, of up to uh, $2,239 for the first child, $1,120 for subsequent. Expired. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Last Monday, the government announced it would force working women to pay childcare fees they couldn't afford. Last Thursday, the government voted against helping pregnant women affected by COVID-19 who are out of work because of COVID-19. Are there any women that the government is prepared to support? Senator Payne. Mr. President, um, I think Senator McAllister is not helping her own cause or anyone else's, frankly, uh, in, uh, in that statement. Clearly, the economic initiatives that the government has advanced in terms of the COVID uh, response are to help all Australians. All Australians. And what I have, what I and others have made clear in relation to the childcare sector is that the sec well, Senator McAllister. Order. Order. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As, uh, as I have made clear, and the Minister, uh, Minister Tian, has made clear, in working with the sector, the changes that the government made in recent weeks to address the childcare sector were very much needed by the sector to ensure it was able to survive and to ensure that it could offer increased care and to ensure that those parents seeking more care were able to obtain it. And a transition payment is being provided by the government, which complements the uh, JobKeeper payment Order, that was Senator previously Payne, in time place for the as part of has that support. Expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. How is the Morrison government ensuring vulnerable women and children experiencing or at risk of all forms of violence are supported during the coronavirus pandemic? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Hughes, for a question on this particularly important matter. Um, the federal government continues to work um, with the sector and with individuals to make sure that women and their children are supported and have the necessary avenues, should they need, to be assisted uh, as a response to family and domestic violence. And over the past few months during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, my colleague, uh, the Minister for Women, Senator Payne, and myself have been working very closely with the state and territory ministers to make sure that. Um, our response is, is appropriate, that we have made sure that we've got all the safety measures in place, uh, particularly recognising that it's actually the states and territories who have the primary responsibility for the delivery of frontline services to women uh, who find themselves in a situation of needing help. But in addition to that, the Morrison government has made available $150 million uh, on top of the existing money that we put into the national plan to reduce violence against women uh, and their children. And as part of that $150 million, $20 million has been invested to increase the capacity of national initiatives uh, that were already in, uh, included in the plan, but to make sure that they are supercharged. Because we don't know, we didn't know at the start of this pandemic, and we still are unsure of what kind of support women are going to need. But as restrictions are starting to be lifted, uh, we need to make sure that we're in a position that we have all of the support services in place so that if women need um, our support, that they are able to get it. So this could include such things as counselling support for families um, or at-risk people. Um, it could also include um, men's behaviour change programs to make sure uh, that we're providing not just short-term but medium and longer-term response to support men during this time. Um, 1800 Respect, making sure that there is sufficient resources to make sure that any woman who needs to access help is able to get it in a very timely manner. Order. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you. How has the government ensured all Australians have access to information about domestic, family and sexual violence and the importance for those affected to seek help? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. During the COVID um, pandemic, it has been uh, very challenging to make sure that all women and children, um, and, and men for that matter, uh, have got access to timely and appropriate information to make sure that they can get the support that they need should they find themselves in a situation of domestic violence. Um, a number of initiatives have been put in place, but uh, one of the most critical information campaigns that we launched during this time is the Help Is Here campaign. And the critical message of the Help Is Here campaign 
is firstly to make sure that, that people know where they are able to get access to the supports they need should they find themselves in a situation of needing that, but also to really reinforce the message that tough times do not excuse tough times at home. So the Help Is Here campaign has used a number of different types of media uh, and traditional media, but particularly we wanted to use more innovative ways. And I'd like to thank the supermarkets, um, Woolies, uh, Coles, Audi and Metcash for making sure that they made available the information in women's restrooms and the like Order, so that Senator women Rustin. could get it. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister highlight the importance of an appropriately executed parliamentary inquiry into family, domestic and sexual violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, it is very important that uh, the inquiry that was referred uh, by myself and the Minister for Women, Minister Payne, recently to the Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs um, was clearly uh, around two things. One was to make sure that we didn't miss the opportunity to learn through this particularly intense pandemic uh, the impacts of the kind of crisis this is on women and their children uh, as it related to, to domestic violence. The second aspect of this that we thought was very important is as we come up to the, the conclusion of the fourth action plan for the protection of women uh, and their children, um, we thought it was a time that we needed to have a look at what was working and what wasn't working. We needed to listen to the experience of the sector, learn how various government services in the community, what they had to say and what they thought we should take into the next plan. But most particularly, we wanted to make sure that we have a platform to make sure all Australians understand that we all have a responsibility if we're really going to make a difference. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much. After that great answer, I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the questions asked by Senators Gallagher and Green. Well, the question asked by Credit Suisse is, is the home builder scheme big enough to really move the needle? Well, Credit Suisse, of course, answered that, that question in their briefing note because they say no. They say it's disappointingly small. They say we doubt the incentives are large enough or the eligibility criteria wide enough to really move the needle. Well, Senator Cormann has explained that this program is going to support 140,000 direct jobs. Well, we'll see whether or not that comes about, because it is telling that even in providing that answer, Senator Cormann was very careful to say that these are estimates only. And we've learned quite a lot about estimates in recent months, haven't we? We've learned quite a lot about the government's capacity to accurately estimate the take-up of their programs, the cost to the budget and the impact on the economy. Because it was a pretty big failure in estimating when it came to JobKeeper, and I have very little confidence in the answer provided today by the minister. And the truth is, that's true for his colleagues as well. And that's why the member for Herbert has gone on the record raising concerns about the program. That's why the member for Leichhardt has raised concerns about the program. And it's why Senator Canavan, represented in this chamber, representing the National Party, is raising concerns about the program. Because anyone who looks at it closely, looks at the fundamentals, at the architecture of this program, knows that it all looks pretty improbable. Australians who earn less than $125,000 a year are expected to spend more than $150,000 on a renovation. Not only that, they're expected to enter into the contract now with no certainty about whether they qualify for the grant. And more broadly, people are generally concerned about their economic position. And it's no more so than in regional Australia. It's one thing to cap a program out at an individual income of $125,000 or a household income of $200,000. What do people think the actual median household income is? What does the coalition actually believe is going on in normal households in regional Australia? Well, I can tell you that in New South Wales, the median income for a household outside of the Sydney metropolitan area is 
That's the expenditure in a regional area uh, like the seat of Page, an area I spend quite a bit of time in. Does the government really think that people whose disposable income at a household level each year is $45,000 are going to be able to stump up the cash to meet the $150,000 threshold that is necessary to even qualify for a program of this kind? Is that really what they think? Well, certainly members of your own government don't believe so, because the member for Herbert are raising concerns is raising concerns that renovations for houses in his electorate won't get anywhere near the $150,000 threshold. That's what the, menace, the member for Leichhardt is raising. Clearly, those people understand that in their areas people do not earn these vast amounts of money that are assumed by the people sitting around in the government benches. Perhaps they haven't saved the money. Perhaps on their $45,000 disposable income a year, they haven't been able to save, put aside in the bank, $150,000. Perhaps they could borrow it. Well, what is the one thing that has been raised over and over and over again by the RBA over the last 18 months? It is the vulnerability of the economy produced exactly by indebtedness, by rising debt to income ratios. Perhaps that is what the member for New England was talking about. Perhaps that was his concern when he said, I'm concerned about the complexity of trying to pay back that debt. Perhaps that's what Senator Canavan was concerned about when he said, I'm worried we're putting ourselves in a weaker position if asset prices in Australia were to fall. People are not sitting on $150,000 waiting, waiting to splash it on a home renovation, and they're not in a position to borrow it. The government's program is not going to produce a much-needed boost for the construction sector. It's not going to help Australian families. It's poorly targeted, and as the Grattan Institute has said, it is classic retail politics, but lousy economics, which is exactly what you'd expect from Scotty from marketing. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, and in taking note of answers today, I do just want to pick on a, uh, a couple of the comments that Senator McAllister just made. Uh, regarding the concern that Australians have for their economic position, because to be honest, I agree with Senator McAllister. I think Australians are certainly uh, concerned about their economic position currently and, and their livelihood, as you would only expect during a pandemic that has had uh, catastrophic impacts upon our economy. But I also think, and here is where I think uh, Senator McAllister's, McAllister's and my views might start to diverge, I think most Australians are are confident that the plan that the Morrison coalition government has to handle the economy coming out of the coronavirus crisis is, is a good one. And that's because this government has been able to demonstrate to the Australian people that we are capable of injecting jobs into the economy. We are capable of strong, responsible budgetary management. And most importantly, we are capable of doing both of those things concurrently. Uh, which is more than I can say for my friends on the opposition benches when they were in government. As Senator Cormann said in his answer today, uh, this government is about jobs, jobs and jobs, and that is something that we delivered on uh, leading up into the coronavirus crisis. We injected 1.5 million jobs into the Australian economy, and that is something that I certainly am incredibly proud of, to be part of a government that successfully uh, did that. As I've said in this place many times, the reason I uh, nominated to uh, be a candidate as a senator for Tasmania was because I've seen too many young Tasmanians have to leave home because they can't get jobs locally. And, and I know, uh, being a young Australian, uh, coming out of the coronavirus crisis, many young Australians are concerned about their livelihood and they are concerned about uh, being able to get a job or keep a job. Uh, and that's why the plan that this government has to ensure that the Australian job market can recover from the coronavirus crisis is so important. I don't want us to see us lose the momentum that we have, uh, particularly in my own state of Tasmania, where, as we know, with Liberal governments state and federally, our state has come a very long way uh, in the last five or six years. And I don't want to see us go back to the dark old economic days. 
Obviously, the government's focus at the moment is on the health and well-being of Australians, and we are seeing great success on the health front. Uh, but we know, as I said, that the impacts of coronavirus across the economy have been severe. Businesses and households are facing increased uncertainty and economic activity has slowed. That's why we have put an economic support package in place to provide timely support to affected workers, businesses and the broader community. And this has helped keep Australians in work and businesses in business. Uh, we've put a floor under the economy and we will lay the foundation for a strong economic recovery coming out of the coronavirus crisis. We are focused on reopening and rebuilding. We need to get businesses back open, enable Australians to go back to work and ensure consumers and businesses have the confidence to return to normal activities. And that's why the home builder policy is so important. It was why our JobKeeper uh, package was so important. These are the measures that the Australian government, the Morrison coalition government, have put in place to ensure that we can rebound from the coronavirus crisis into just as prosperous and successful a nation and successful economy as we were in prior to this. Madam Deputy President, I turned 30 years old just a couple of weeks ago, and when I was thinking about uh, this significant birthday, I did reflect on the fact that so many Australians uh, my age are going to be experiencing most likely a recession for the first time uh, at some point over the next six months. Uh, it's been 29 years since Australia last had a recession. And that is incredibly hard, and it will be hard on young Australians to uh, navigate their way through that and the stresses that that will put upon their work prospects. But young Australians also know that this government has a strong uh, economic policy in place to help us recover from the coronavirus, and that is built on the trust that we have with the Australian people the trust that is built upon our record, our record of creating 1.5 million jobs in just over five years. That is the record of this government, and it is because of that record that the Australian people have faith in us as a government to rebuild following the coronavirus crisis, to make sure that more young Australians can keep themselves in jobs for now and into the foreseeable future. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Deputy President. And, uh, as we speak, I'm just concluding the build of a house. So I've had the uh, great experience of interacting with subcontractors, tradies and uh, small businesses in the building industry, and they are looking at a, a cliff of unemployment. The pipeline is definitely drying up, and I think that they were all quite excited with the announcement of Home Builder. But, as has been pointed out in this chamber today, the actual tailoring of this scheme doesn't do what its intended purpose should be, and that is to get people continuing to work. So the builders I've spoken to, the tradespeople I've spoken to, say that come December of this year, all the new bills that commenced 12 months ago will be finished, the pipeline is diminished, and this scheme just doesn't do it. The age. Experts pan the scheme. The financial review. Flaws highlighted. The weekend Australia. Home builder doesn't do enough for tradies. The Guardian. A blunder. Mr Harry uh, Trigamoff doesn't address units. They're excluded. And the Canberra Times points out very precisely that people and victims of the bushfires are also excluded. So when you look at this scheme and you see who the architect is, the assistant treasurer, I think, Mr Suka, your mind goes back to an earlier scheme where, when we asked, was there any treasury expertise uh, used in designing this type of scheme? Did he get any economic rationale? And the answer was no. And this is the uh, first home buyer scheme that was announced during the election. And what is very clear when you go into these sorts of policies, there is always agreement among economists. It is exceedingly difficult to work out the economic rationale for it. And if you have ever built your own house or gone into a contract with a builder, they are business people. And what they will try and do is get you to put a fancy heater in some flaws in and borrow the money to do that. 
Now, if this 25,000 goes into a new build, then the end result is that a, a, a first home buyer says, oh, I can now put in a $12,000 floor or I can put in a fancy heater. <laughs> the reality is that's an awful economic decision because you shouldn't be borrowing that over 25 years. Bricks and mortar, fair enough, but the furnishings and the fixtures and fittings. And I've actually heard stories of builders saying, don't worry, with that contract you signed last month, we'll tear it up and do a new one because you'll get 25 grand. Um, we're looking after you. So the economic evaluation of these schemes is that they're really not uh, as economically good as they're purported to be. And so this is exceedingly bad uh, timing in sort of, uh, it's quick, you've got to do it by I think the 4th of December, 150000 for a renovation? I chose to knock down a house because it was going to cost me 60000 to do a renovation. Why would I spend 150000 in most areas outside of Capital City, Melbourne and uh, Sydney on a renovation? I mean, you can get a house and land package in the outskirts of Adelaide for 300000 All right, as you move in, 10, 15 k's or 8 k's from the city, that package is more likely to be 600. But you know, these figures don't stack up. So is it another case of Mr Sucker getting some very targeted policy to go where he thinks there's a few votes? Because it doesn't seem to be broad enough to do what he's actually intending, which is keep people employed, to build the pipeline of work. It's tightly constrained. It appears to be targeted, but we don't see the underpinning uh, economic rationale for that. And it may well be at estimates and the like when we ask for that sort of rationale, it may well be it comes back to the standard answer is it was a decision of government, we didn't give advice on it. Now hopefully that's not the case because I really would like to see the underpinning economic evaluation of this policy as to why it's targeted in such a way. And the opposition has rightfully put up the task or the challenge to the government, why have you not done any public housing? Why is there no public housing policy for this government? Why wouldn't you use this as a time to prime that pump and to get some building into that vital sector where there is a desperate need for it? Clearly the government's gone missing. Uh, Senator Rennick. Thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I don't know about you, but there seems to be a smell wafting through this place. At first I thought it might have been a leaked septic tank, but no, it turns out it's the Australian Labor Party. Because we find out that not only are they trying to get into the coffers of the hard-working Australians by ripping out their union fees and by dipping into their superannuation funds, they find out that they're branch stacking. And the worst thing about these allegations is, is the tawdry language. Uh, Senator Rennick, the tawdry please, language. Please, I'm getting there. I'm coming there. Senator Rennick, there's yep. a point of order. Please resume your seat. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Madam Deputy President, is in taking note of answers. The the senator opposite appears to be. Egregiously off topic. Off Thank topic. you, um, Senator Gallagher. As you know, this is a broad-ranging debate, and I was just waiting to see if Senator Rennick was getting to the the questions. Thank, Thank you, you Madam Rennick. Deputy Speaker, and I was because this side of the chamber wants to get people and wants to stack families into homes, and that is why we are, pre are very proud of the Home Builder Program because it will support up to a million jobs indirectly and 140,000 jobs indirectly. And can I say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that homes are in the DNA of the Liberal Party? And why do we know that? Because in our party's uh, opening speech from our founder, Robert Menzies, he mentions the word no less than 23 times. And I'm going to quote this because it's worth remembering. As, as Robert Menzies said, I do not believe that the real life of this nation is to be found in either great luxury hotels and the petty gossip of so-called fashionable suburbs. It is to be found in the homes of people who are nameless and, ad and unadvertised. And whatever their individual religious conviction or dogma, see in their children their greatest contribution to the immortality of their race. The home is the foundation of sanity and sobriety. It is the indispensable condition of continuity. The health determines the, its health determines the health of society as a whole. And this party is proud to support jobs and it is proud to support our building industry, which will, only, which will, also, which will help our carpenters, our builders, our, our brickies, our electricians. 
and it will help small traders, it will help architects, it will help home designers, it will help engineers. And I should I say that the party has also helped this year by helping with the first home loan deposit scheme to help eligible first home buyers purchase the modest home with a deposit as little as 5 per cent, allowing them to get into the market earlier. Australian first home buyers have now reserved all of this year's financial first home loan deposit scheme guarantees. And that is a good indication of how our younger people want to get into housing. Because as we've said as I've said previously, housing is where the home is, it's where the heart is, it is where the family is. And there is no greater proof of our indication of our support for the Australian people than supporting people into homes. Because this side of the chamber is about supporting people into homes. That side of the chamber is about homelessness. This side of the chamber is about lower taxes. That side of the chamber is about higher taxes. This side of the chamber is about jobs. That side of the chamber is about no jobs. And most of all, this side of the chamber is the party of free choice, whereas that party side of the chamber is the party or the side of total control. And we also support, and I'll just pick up uh, Senator Gallagher there. We actually do support uh, uh, community housing. Uh, we have over 1.3 billion in the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation program, uh, and we also support the delivery of 1,500 new social and affordable dwe dwellings and the refinancing of a further 5,000 existing dwellings. On top of that, we also provide uh, rent seeker on top of uh, the New Start allowance, which is another way in which we support housing in this country. Uh, Home Builder will work with the uh, state and territories on this, and they are expected to be well placed to administer the Home Builder program, as most already administer similar first home buyer schemes, including the first home owner grant and the stamp duty concessions through their respective state or territory revenue office. And the government's focus on health and the well-being of Australians is why we support home ownership. And we are seeing success on that. This is the party that will increase the level of home ownership. It will, and by doing that, we will improve the health of Australians. You know, when we were going through the COVID crisis, it was great to have a home to go back to and, and, and it's the support. And it's interesting, actually, the feedback we get from people now, how much they enjoyed spending it, how much they enjoyed spending time at home with their children. Uh, heaven forbid. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, I'll um, leave it at that. Cheers. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Ayres. Well, it's always a um, special experience following uh, Senator Rennick uh, in one of these debates. Um, it's like a sort of um, I, I, I think it's, uh, it should be illegal, the, uh, the feeling it gives one listening to Senator Rennick's uh, lofty tones going through the, um, oh, going through the debate. He's Senator, the Ayres. Senator Ayres, please resume your seat. Senator Rennick. Point of order there. Could he please uh, deal with the question on notice, please? Thank you. And uh, I remind Senator Ayres this is a broad-ranging debate and I'm giving him the opportunity to get there. Uh, he's only for 20 odd seconds in. Thank you, Senator. I, I, I certainly intend to get to the substance of the um, of the debate, but I did want to reflect um, reflect on the previous contribution. It's a transcendental experience, really, listening to Senator Rennick. He's the beat poet of the Senate. It's a sort of series of of um, uh, odd allusions brought together that make uh, that make very little very little sense. Almost as much sense as the policy justification for home builder that's been made here and in other places. I understand that Mr Sukar said that it would support 140,000 jobs, 27,000 building projects. I mean, just combining those two numbers for a minute makes you realise how fundamentally uh, ill-conceived uh, the policy foundations of this scheme are. It has all the hallmarks of a Morrison government policy announcement. It will increase inequality. It will provide negligible stimulus. There's a very big number attached to the program—$688 million. So a very big number. By not being a round number, it conveys the impression that it's somehow precise. So the number's big, 
conveys the impression of precision, but there will, of course, be, like all of these schemes, zero delivery. Very little money will go out the door. It's all about the announcement, not about the delivery. No doubt there's a television ad coming our way soon to make sure that people understand how precisely large the amount of money is, how precisely precise it is, how, what enormous stimulus it will provide. No doubt there will be people in high-vis jackets. Maybe they could borrow Senator Canavan's high-vis jacket. It doesn't get much use. Uh, no doubt there will be earnest expressions of support for the tradespeople of Australia, but zero delivery. It's a scheme that will pay people a small amount of money in the context of an overall building project to do building projects or renovations that they were going to do anyway. You can't find a person in the building industry, a serious person in the building industry, who supports this proposition. You certainly can't find a sensible economist, you know, one with a degree and a bit of postgraduate uh, learning, who is prepared to go out and publicly advocate for this scheme. It is all spin, no substance, big announcement, no delivery. And some people, sceptical people, believe that this announcement is all about the politics. I'm not sure that that's true. I'm not sure that that's true. I don't think. I think you would struggle to find a household in Eden Monero that will benefit from the home builder scheme. All of the focus group work, all of the data work, all of the sort of clever work that that is done in the Liberal Party National Secretariat has produced this policy as somehow a policy that's going to provide some advantage. But the problem is when it meets the real world, there won't be too many people. 22,000, Senator Cormann said, had registered interest already, which just establishes that the people who are registering interest for this project are people who would already decided to build. It is just like a vacuum sucking forward uh, projects that people were proposing to do, dragging them into this side of Christmas. And what that means is no extra work will actually be done. It will just shift when small building projects were going to be done. What an extraordinary claim that this, pro that this program will support 140,000 additional jobs. If you look at median and house prices in Cooma, 317,500. It's very hard to imagine that $150,000 renovation is going to be done to one of those homes. It's a program that will overcapitalise a very small number of people's property. It won't deliver a single extra job, uh, and it will be uh, just Peter one more Ayres, policy your failure time has from the expired. government. So the question is that the motion is moved to take note of answers moved by Senator McAllister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the uh, response given to me by Senator Payne, uh, the Foreign Minister, in relation to my question about Australian citizen uh, Calm you. Gillespie, who's just been sentenced to the death penalty um, in Guangzhou in China. Um, like many uh, Australians, I was appalled to learn over the, the weekend that Calm Gillespie was sentenced to death last week. And even though Mr Gillespie had been detained in China since late 2013, uh, some six and a half years, the Australian public only became aware of this case when the Guangzhou Intermediate People's Court posted a notice on its website. This is in stark contra contrast, of course, to other cases where Australians overseas face the death penalty, like the Bali Nine in Indonesia, for example. Australian media reported on that trial. The Australians shared uh, the pain of Andrew Chan and Myron Sukumaran's loved ones as they were sentenced to death and then sadly executed on the 25th of April, uh, 29th of April 2015. Uh, we campaigned for clemency and we did what we could to support them during their time in prison. In the case of Calm Gillespie, the Australian public has been kept in the dark. I spoke just last week in this place about China's opaque and unjust judicial system where the right to a fair trial doesn't exist. 
We've seen this time and time again. Um, there is the case of Australian academic Dr Yang, who's been charged with espionage, even though we haven't seen any evidence against him. Dr Yang has been held for long periods of isolation, and there are serious concerns at his treatment. And then there are the Australians, permanent residents and their family members who have been caught up in the crackdown against the Uyghurs in China's Xinjiang province, which I also spoke about in this place last week. At least in those cases, we have been aware of their detention and have been able to raise our concerns publicly, which is why the Australian government must let the public know when it first became aware of Mr Gillespie's arrest and at what levels and what times it's raised his case with the Chinese government. While it's well and good to offer a private briefing to senators and MPs on consular matters, especially given that Senate estimates didn't occur in May, unless there's a genuine concern that it would further imperil an Australian citizen, it's not a substitute for providing this information to the Australian public. In Mr Gillespie's case, the softly, softly approach clearly has not worked. Furthermore, it's critical that we know how many more Australian citizens or permanent residents are stuck in jail in China and how many of them are at risk of facing the death penalty during this particularly difficult period in our relationship with China. Um, in my final few minutes, I'd like to move on to another troubling, troubling consular case in that region, that of Chow Van Can. Uh, Mr Chow is a, re a retired baker from Sydney, and today he'll be spending his 71st birthday in a remote prison in Vietnam. He was convicted of terrorism late last year and sentenced to 12 years in prison, all because of his affiliation and activities with an opposition political party. Mr Chow has not been accused of violence or attempted violence, but was convicted regardless following a four-and-a-half-hour trial. Vietnam is a one-party state that does not tolerate dissent. Mr Chow is currently one of more than 160 political prisoners in the country. And he's not spoken to his wife or children since his arrest 18 months ago, and consular officials haven't been allowed to visit since January. We call on the Australian government to redouble its efforts to free Mr Chow. We must demand that Vietnam release him on humanitarian grounds as an immediate priority, given his age, medical condition and his risk of serious illness if he contracts coronavirus. Chow Van Cam should be at home with his family on his 71st, birth 71st birthday, not languishing in a Vietnamese prison. Um, Senator Waters, before I put your taking note motion, I just remind you that um, you really do need to speak about the answers you've taken note of. So the latter part of your contribution wasn't that. Um, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.